whatever it just said, got it. Thank you so much for coming this afternoon. I'm honored that you decided to spend part of your afternoon with me. I'm Frank Baker and I have written this book, We Survived the Holocaust. And I'm very honored that you have come to learn more about it. I'm gonna start right here. What do you know about the Holocaust? Where did you learn it? Was it in a history class from a book, a film, survivor's testimony? Now think now for a moment about today's young people, many of whom are not receiving their news and information from the same trustworthy sources that we've relied on for years. Allow me to start with a confession. I will not make any money from the sale of this book. I have told the family members who were my collaborators that I am going to donate all of my royalties to Holocaust education efforts here in South Carolina. So if you're purchasing a book today, you're contributing to that effort. So you may not be aware of what a graphic novel is. Well, after today, you'll know. Take a look at the images here. They were created by an award-winning illustrator that I worked with for a year and a half while writing We Survived the Holocaust. This is not a comic book as some would assume, nor is the content graphic as some would guess. The graphic novel is the most popular form of literacy in school libraries today. Ask any school librarian. They'll tell you the diary of Anne Frank now a graphic novel. Every Shakespeare play is now a graphic novel. The 9-11 Commission Report, which I found in the bookstore this thick, is now a graphic adaptation endorsed by the 9-11 Commissioners. And the late Congressman John Lewis worked on a series of books about his civil rights struggle. And the series of books is called March. So if you're not already aware, Recent surveys nationally have indicated that many people, including young people, lack essential knowledge about the Holocaust. I've asked myself, what's happening in education that this could be happening? Here's a clue. Last April, a Virginia middle school student wrote in a widely published commentary that her Holocaust education consisted of one slide about concentration camps and one handout. No wonder she concluded, many of us lack the knowledge. So that's one of the reasons that I wrote this book, to give young people a true story with facts and with evidence. Thanks to the generosity of the Goldberg family, my collaborators on this project, a copy of the book will be donated to every public middle school and high school in the state. And we're making plans to take the book and an accompanying teacher guide all around the state so that every teacher knows this story and has a new resource, a new tool in their toolkit. I'd like to thank Sister Margaret. I'd, I'd like to thank Pauline Books. I'd like to thank the diocese for inviting me to come this afternoon. It is an honor and a privilege to be on this premises to talk about this subject. Now for a little background. I want you to know that before he passed away, Felix Goldberg of blessed memory spoke at Yom HaShoah, the annual day of remembrance ceremony at our synagogue in Columbia. He had just testified about his Holocaust experience. So as he stepped off that stage, he hands me his speech. And he says, Frankie, in the most beautiful Polish accent, I will never forget it. Frankie, do something for this. Little did I know that his words would have the kind of impact that has had on my life. I sat with that speech for years. A rabbi told me recently, Frank, the time was not right. You were not ready. 
I didn't feel qualified to tell his story. But I finally came to the realization that I was ready. I approached the family and asked if I could create a website about their parents, a website called storiesofsurvival.org. It was created for educators that they could use to ensure their students understand the facts and could hear the story from real people. The family loaned me a box and in it was a number of documents, papers that had survived the war. And one of the things that had survived was Mr. Goldberg's Buchenwald ID card. I discovered the name of the ship that brought the Goldbergs from Germany to Columbia, South Carolina. And as part of my research, I discovered a short film of the maiden voyage of that ship. I showed it to the family and they were all amazed. They said, Frank, we, we never knew. This, this is the ship, you're showing me the ship my parents were on. Columbia, South Carolina, upon arriving in, in Columbia, Bluma Goldberg was quoted as she stepped off that train. She said, I had less than a dollar in my pocket. I spoke no English and I had an infant son. Columbia, a new and welcoming place as it happened. A national magazine named Columbia a model city for how to help resettle displaced persons. The Jewish community had gotten together and created committees on jobs and housing and clothing and how to learn English, everything the new arrivals would need to get started in the new city. Imagine that. The memory of the horrors of the war faded away as the Goldberg started a new life. They were often interviewed and spoke at schools, community groups, because they lived the slogan, never forget. Mr. Goldberg said, and I quote, I know they're hearing it every year, but you still have to remind people. Luma Goldberg said, in a way we fear that's why we survive, so that we can tell the story. And here I am sharing their story with you, thanks to the family's blessing, via the website and, and now the book, illustrated by my award-winning colleague, Tim, Tim Ogline, and you can see his, his work behind me. In addition to the Goldberg's story, the book dives into the roots of anti-Semitism because the Goldbergs were not born and then anti-Semitism started. It was already there. There are so many lessons to be learned here, but only if educators and readers recognize them and help young people understand. Even today, there are signs and signals reminiscent of what happened more than 70 years ago. Troubling rhetoric, book banning, limiting the kinds of people we allow into the country, discrimination, prejudice, hatred of another just because of their religion. Yes, many lessons. I'll end here with the words of the late Elie Wiesel, a survivor himself of Buchenwald. He said, we must take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor. He also said to remain silent and indifferent is the greatest sin of all. And lastly, to forget the Holocaust is to kill twice. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Do you have any questions? I just want a clarification. You said that for the parents, there was not, if there was anti Semitism already present, you said they, they were born into it, so which means it has its roots way back. Thousands of years. Thousands. 
Yeah, and in and, and, and our book, we couldn't go back thousands of years. We go back a few hundred years and we give a little bit of the context because I, I think young people hear the word anti-Semitism, they don't know what it means. They hear the word Holocaust and the surveys have already indicated they don't know what it means, nor did they understand the impact. They don't know, the surveys have indicated many cannot name more than one concentration camp. They don't know how many Jews were actually killed by the Nazis. And not just Jews, there were 20 million killed. And so we can't forget the others. And we can't forget the other genocides that have occurred since World War II. Um, I, I really want this book to be a catalyst for learning and asking questions. What do I need to know that I did not already know? And we might ask that question of ourselves because there are so many Holocaust stories yet to be told. And I'm beginning to think that the reason we have so many Holocaust education initiatives in South Carolina and around the United States is because it's not sinking in, in public education. And so other organizations have stepped in and are doing wonderful work with webinars, with curriculum, with survivor testimonies. And I, I chose the graphic novel form because I knew it would appeal to young people. I mean, I, I, I had written a website. I could have written a regular book with just photographs, but I thought, wouldn't this make a good visual story? And so, you know, here I am with, this is a scene, the last time Blumen and her sister saw their mother, the Nazis were at the door knocking and she gave them money and jewelry and said, run out the back door now, go into the woods, do not come back. And they did. And the girls stayed together throughout the war. And they both previously testified that it wasn't, if it weren't for the other, they wouldn't have survived. And, and here, I don't know if you can see the, the mezuzah, the mezuzah being a Jewish prayer that adorns the frame of most homes with a blessing that says, please bless those who come in and out. But in this scene, Felix Goldberg's father is, is prying the mezuzah off of their home in Poland. And, and Felix is pleading with his father, father, why are you taking it off? Why, why? And his father says, you have to understand the times in which we live. If we are identified now as Jews, it's likely that we will be victims. To me, these are powerful, powerful images. And I, I believe that um, teachers could take any one page and make a lesson out of them. I also think because it's an award-winning illustrator, this is visual literacy. You, you can look at the pictures, you can look at the words, you can begin to describe expressions on faces, all of those things. And I think visual literacy is an, another really important um, lesson that I think all students need. In today's world, I think visual literacy is very strong in the elementary grades, but it falls off in middle school and high school. And I think that's probably where they need it most, how to read an image, whether that image is the cover of a book, or inside of a book or a magazine cover or a photograph. Visual literacy, I think is so important. Well, I'm very glad that uh, you did this because um, I think the world today, if you look at it, this happened uh, to the Jewish people. It's, if you look at the world today with it's Christians, Catholics. So if we don't see how history repeats itself and go to, and see and want to look closely at it and say it's real, I, how it's going to just keep repeating itself with different groups. So I, 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 you know, that's how I, I feel. 
I have to tell you, several months ago, my illustrator shared with me an image from the book, and it was Bluma and her family running from their first home that was set on fire by the Nazis. And when I first saw that image, I immediately went to Ukraine. I said, these are, these are the Ukrainians. This is the Ukrainians running from their homes, being destroyed by another dictator. A, a tyrant for, for what for what you know it, it, it just we, we need to help people understand that it is happening again we need to take action and take steps um, and we need to we need to make students more aware of, of their world I, I i believe in many ways that our students are are rather myopic their world is 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 a small frame that they don't see outside maybe their 15 mile radius from school to home. And there's so many things in our world that impact them and affect them. And I fear that where they get their news today is totally inadequate. They don't know how to question the sources. They don't know how to verify information. And we know that Holocaust denialism and anti-Semitism are rampant in social media despite those companies pledges to remove that material, it continues to happen. Even our local synagogue, okay? even our churches, because we had the, the shooting here, of course, remembered other in Atlanta, which is a whole other level of fear of the other. And then here, just next across from St. Mary's, um, I went over to this the synagogue gift shop on Sunday, and they had to have people guarding the front and the gift shop. And it wasn't just a normal thing. And I felt terrible about that because of because the fear exists. And I, I know um, when I learned about the Holocaust, and I know our sisters are all over the world, there's a fear that people don't know how to look at something and apply it to their own life. I think that's something that's difficult for young people, especially, but even adults. You can have the knowledge, but not know how to apply it to your life. So if you have any suggestions for application. <laughs> I, I believe, uh, I'm with you 110%. I believe we have to share these stories. I think the, the personal narrative, mm -hmm. and here we are in South Carolina. This is a mm -hmm. couple who settled in South Carolina and became successful business people, despite the, the horrors that they went through. Um, they can read the diary of Anne Frank. That's, that's one thing. But I think we have to move beyond that story to other stories. And there are so many books out right now by Holocaust survivors. Uh, so a teacher, a parent, an educator has many to choose from. But I think it's really important to evaluate that story. Is that story appropriate for the young person that I am trying to reach? Um, the Goldberg family were collaborators in this book. And I, I knew their, family, their, their parents' story from videotaped testimony, from newspaper articles, from my own research. But I sat down with each of the family members individually, and each of them told me stories that had not previously been documented. And to me, that was the beauty of being the author. The author asks questions. He digs a little bit deeper. I pull back the, the, the layers. I will share with you one story uh, that the, the, the oldest child, um, Henry Goldberg, shared with me. He said, uh, just before his father died, he asked his oldest son to come in the room and close the door. He had something he wanted to tell him. And uh, Henry did it. And his father said, I need to, 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 to tell you something that I've never told anybody before today. He said, I helped build the gallows at Buchenwald. Mm -hmm. And he started to cry. He had held that in for... 80 some odd years. And it wasn't until he knew his time was coming that he 
wanted to share that. His son knew that he had been a coal mine operator. So he brought Jews up and down the coal mine elevator, but he also carried bodies out. So he was very, very close to death many times. In the book, we detail the story of he was in line with Joseph Mengele, the famous doctor of death. Mengele was known for putting Jews in a line as they got off the train. He pointed to the left, you went to the crematoria. You pointed to the right, you survived. Mr. Goldberg was in line three times and was pointed to the right. Mr. Goldberg survived a death march. At one point in the death march, they uh, came upon a potato farm. And the Nazis said, you may get one potato, but not two. If we see you get more than one, we'll kill you. Mr. Goldberg got his one, got back in line, got his second one, and he got in line again. And he said, in testimony, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die with a full stomach. That was the way. He, he took risks. And, and, and before she was Mrs. Goldberg, she was Bluma Tischgarten. And she was also with her sister, slave laborers. They worked um, in munitions factories, creating bullets. Very difficult, difficult, hot circumstances. She relays one story of their supervisor that every time he walked past them, they shook with fear. She had been working almost all night and she faded asleep and he came by and he slapped her awake. And she said, I never fell asleep again. But also the risks, Bluma's sister got very, very sick. Bluma didn't think she would live. Bluma left the barracks in the middle of the night, went into the kitchen and took an apple and brought it back to her sister to help bring her back to health. She took a risk. I originally wanted to title this book, We Survived the Holocaust, Risk, Resilience, and Renewal. And that's what I think about when I think about the Goldbergs. And I'm honored to be here to share this story because I think it needs to be shared and we wanna get it out there. And I'm thankful to Pauline Books because the book will be available here. So anybody listening can order it from Pauline Books. And with that, I'll stop and, and we will sign books for those who would like to get the author's signature. I'll ask him and see if he says yes. Thank you very much. Thank you.